Now, we're all aware of security and privacy concerns that surround our use of emails and social media, whether it's phishing scams, Trojan horses, you name it. But now with the proliferation of mobile devices that track our movements and in initiate interactions, those concerns are even more acute. And if you're like me, you're worried about keeping your personal information safe. I'm lucky, I'm joined by two experts on privacy and security in this brave new world. Peter Drushaw, who's the scientific director of the Max Planck Institute for Software Systems, and Stefan Saruru, a senior researcher at Microsoft Research. Welcome, gentlemen. Um, Thank you. Peter, I want to start with you. What concerns you most these days in terms of privacy? Well, one concern has to do with these many popular applications and services that keep track of people's locations, their physical activities, their health status, and increasingly also their social encounters. Now, on the one hand, these applications are fantastic because they help people organize their lives, um, you know, stay fit and healthy, and also uh, get in touch with uh, some of the people in their vicinity. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, these applications and services really take the privacy risks to an entirely new level uh, because they really blur the distinction between online and offline worlds. They're not only recording you know, your online activity, which is deliberate and voluntary, but they sort of seamlessly track your physical whereabouts, and uh, that is, um, you know, something that uh, raises the question of what happens to the data that's being recorded, and I think that's something we'll really have to pay attention to. So they can get hold of the information exploited. I mean, uh, how exactly do they do that? Well, um, the problem starts with the fact that these applications really store um, and collect and store this data and initially store it on your mobile device. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, if, um, you know, you contract some malware, which is easy enough to do, you go to the wrong website, you open an email attachment or you fall for one of the phishing attacks, uh, that malware can compromise your phone and potentially get access and expose that kind of data. Another important risk is that you know, many of these apps actually upload that data to the app provider's uh, cloud website. And at that point, the user really has no control or not even knowledge of what happens to the data from that point on. Um, and how do we counter these threats? Are there, you know, are there tools or behaviors that we should adopt to prevent you know, this unwanted spying? Right. Well, in terms of tools, there really, there really isn't that much available today in production. Right? Um, you all know when you install an app, um, you're supposed to grant permission for that app to install, so, you know, to access certain information like your contacts, uh, or you get access to certain sensors like your uh, location provider. Um, but quite often, right, these requests seem plausible to us, and we're interested in the functionality that this application provides, so we grant it. And this is really an all or nothing decision because, you know, once the application has access to the information, we don't really know mm -hmm. and can control what happens, you know, how it's being used, how it's being disseminated. Uh, now, there is quite a bit of research in the area, right? There are people working on techniques to try to track the flow of information through such applications. Um, there are uh, people working on encryption. I think uh, Stefan is going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, we've also been working on something towards developing a communication platform that enables such apps to, you know, uh, contact and communicate with nearby devices, but in a way that uh, keeps the user in control of their privacy. Um, I gather there's another aspect, um, and that's the privacy of bystanders. Um, can you describe the issue here? Yes, yeah, so this is a related aspect, and it's got to do with the fact that uh, our smartphones and increasingly wearable devices have these sophisticated audio-visual audio uh, capture um, uh, capabilities, which has led actually to uh, com entirely new creative outlets. You know, people are taking videos and pictures all the time, upload them on Facebook, on YouTube. That's a fantastic thing. Um, but the thing that really hasn't been addressed is that quite often in social uh, situations, you know, um, unrelated bystanders just incidentally get captured in such a recording, and in many situations they're not actually uh, okay with that. Right? I mean, this is kind of a different issue, isn't it? it? Short of going around getting signed permission um, of all these people and all these people who might be on your social media, how can you invo av avoid invading their privacy? Well, uh, it's indeed a challenge because on the one hand, you want to respect people's privacy. On the other hand, you want to preserve the spontaneity and ubiquity of this kind of uh, digital capture. Uh, so we've been uh, working actually on a prototype where the idea is to enable uh, people to state their preferences with respect to capture privacy. Um, in dependent on their current context. So they can say, for instance, when I'm among friends, you know, no restrictions on image capture. When I'm at the workplace, also no restriction. But when I'm in public, you know, I want to have my face blurred. And when I'm at the beach or a similar location like the gym or a healthcare facility, I don't want to have my image captured at all. 
Um, this would be recorded by my own uh, smart device, my smartphone for instance, and then advertised to nearby capture devices over a short range radio. And capture devices in their platform would then be enabled to essentially receive these pre preferences and um, check an, a captured image to see if uh, some bystander was captured and then you know, edit the media, the video or the image to respect that person's privacy. And, and you know, how, how, how do the public view these in, inadvertent privacy invasions? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, there is some work on that uh, from social scientists, and we've also done a small-scale uh, online survey on this. And essentially the outcomes are that, on the one hand, uh, people's preferences with respect to this kind of capture are very situational, right? It depends on the context. You know, who's around me? Am I among friends, among strangers? Who is the photographer, right? Is it uh, a friend? Is it someone in some kind of an official function, like a wedding photographer, or is it a complete stranger? And secondly, what we found is, and others have found as well, is that there are considerable individual differences among uh, preferences that people have in the same situation. So it seems to be a cultural and, very, and personal thing. Um, thanks very much for that. Stefan, I'm, I, I want to ask you the same opening question right. I asked Peter. What concerns you most these days about you know, privacy and security? So, you know, everything that Peter sa said actually concerns me as well. But additionally, the thing that concerns me is that the ease by which, you know, these mobile devices that we're carrying, how easily they're lost or stolen. Arguably, I think it's pretty clear that that uh, mobile, you know, smartphones and tablets are much more easily lost or stolen than, than desktops were, or even laptops. And um, can encryption solve this problem? Right, so, so um, you know, for a long time people were worried about lost devices, especially with laptops, mm. and uh, both the industry and research community basically came up with these systems that offer encryption of your data. And what they do is, the, the guarantee they offer is called protecting data at rest. So, whenever the data is stored on your hard drive, on your storage system, um, the data is encrypted. And uh, the keys that we use to actually encrypt this data are protected by some password or PIN that uh, the user is asked to enter when these devices actually uh, start up. And because most of the time laptops are either shut down or hibernating, this is an adequate sort of security model. On the other hand, uh, tablets and smartphones are rarely shut down. They are often yeah. in this sleep state and all it takes is you know, pressing the power button mm -hmm. actually they resume operation and have all these data lying unencryptedly in, in their RAMs. Um, and both enterprises and device owners are very, are very concerned with a number of attacks uh, that can be mounted to steal you know, data, unencrypted data lying in these devices' memories. Mm. Oh, and what kind of attacks? I mean, you know, are there any current or potential technological solutions yeah, to the, those? These, uh, definitely. These attacks have been known for a long time. Um, um, you know, they basically are referred to in the literature as memory attacks. And one class of attacks are cold boot attacks, where, where actually uh, it turns out that when, when a piece of memory loses power, um, it still preserves its contents for a short period of time. This is referred to the data remnants property that memory has. So the attack typically is that, you know, I can basically steal your phone and maybe reflash it with my own software. Mm -hmm. And while it's reflashing and going through that reboot cycle, I can, the memory still preserves some of its contents and I can read them that way. But they're also bu what's, what they're called bus monitoring attacks, where I actually look at the data that flows between your, your processor and the memory. And there are actually trivial uh, devices that actually inspect, read this memory traversing these buses. In fact, there's a company that sells a bus monitoring uh, device that you can plug in your iPad and transform your iPad into this device that can read secrets from memory. Wow. <coughs> and um, uh, encryption technologies, um, will they, you know, are they available? Are they yes, available yet? Yes, yes, yes. So, so basically what the, sort of the next uh, barrier for us or the next sort of goal for us mm. is to make sure that data uh, stays or sensitive data at the very least remains encrypted even when it's in memory. Mm. So the, the model, you know, the system that we're actually going uh, towards is one where every time sensitive data leaves the boundary or the perimeter of the processor is going to be encrypted. Yeah. So the only place when the data is actually unencrypted is in the processor. And mounting attacks on the processor is much more difficult, much more costlier. Um, and you know, we're, we've built a system like that where you, you, know, you can take your email or your, and your contact information and make sure that whenever you process on it, it has this property that all data is encrypted when it lies in memory. Um, what do you suggest people do in the meantime? And, and how long um, have we got to wait 
for right, you know, right. these encryption processes. So, so, so encrypted memory, actually, if you look at the industry trends, it's coming down the road. Mm -hmm. um, um, the hardware manufacturers are sort of you know, putting resources into coming up with hardware solutions to make sure that our uh, memory is encrypted at all times. Mm -hmm. Uh, nevertheless, a hardware-only uh, solution is actually expensive and it's difficult to adopt because uh, building hardware is expensive and, and deploying yeah. it in practice takes you know, several iterations of, of the market to sort of renew their devices. So that's why in the meantime we've been working on software-only solutions that leverage uh, today's hardware to actually provide these guarantees. Nevertheless, the hardware solution will be much more performant, much better. So I expect probably in about a decade that most of the devices you're going to uh, finding stores are going to have at least some form of encrypted memory in them. Um, Peter, I'd like you to ask, answer the same sort of question about um, how do people protect themselves now in terms of social media apps and um, from having you know, information stolen? Well, I think the only general uh, advice one could give is to be judicious in, in uh, selecting like apps that we install and services that we sign up for, right? So in general, one shouldn't just evaluate these kinds of apps and services by the functionality they provide. Right? Mm. That's usually very appealing, mm. but ask, you know, what data does it collect? Is there a legitimate need for that data to be collected? And what happens to that data later on? Now, in general, it's difficult to answer these questions, particularly for a layperson, but one could, for instance, uh, look, you know, does the provider have a privacy statement? Does that answer such questions that I just asked, right? Is the provider a reputable company that operates in a jurisdiction that can be expected to, uh, to enforce these kinds of rules and have laws that respect privacy? Stefan, Peter, thank you um, for your information. Some, if somewhat a little bit disquieting about privacy and security in thank a world you. of mobile devices. Um, now. Let's go back to the demo floor where Scarlett has drummed up some pretty information, pretty good information for us. <laughs> 